I was just 16 months old when my dad saved my life here. 19 years ago, Tasnim Lowe's home was destroyed in a fire. Police in Shropshire have begun a murder inquiry after a suspected arson attack in which a mother and her two teenage daughters were killed. I was found wrapped in a blanket under an apple tree. I got a bit of fire on my face. In that fire, Tasnim lost her grandmother, her aunt, her mum, and then her dad when he was convicted of their triple murder. My dad carried me out of the house. He wanted to look after me, but he didn't really look after me. And he uh, let my mom die. Now, Tasnim's dad is up for parole and could be released from prison. And the parole board has asked Tasnim to tell them what she thinks. I don't know what I'm supposed to say or how I feel about my dad, because I don't know him. So Tasnim is looking for answers. There's a lot of questions. Why? Why did he do this? What really went on? Her search will reveal a shocking secret. You know, they are very controlling. Um, it has to be their way or no way. As time went on, she started to hate him. She wanted away from him and he wouldn't let her go. And it will take her deep into the heart of a scandal that rocked a community. It's like you're knowing your whole life that something is this way. And then all of a sudden, without even realising, bang, you're over here. So I went to my granddad's the other day and I got quite a lot of things from him. So there's loads of photos. There's me and Lucy, my mum. That was my christening. I think this is probably the only photo that we've actually got together. Do you think you look like your mum? A little bit. I feel like I look like the brown version of Lucy. When I think about Lucy, I think of a teenager. I don't really see her as a mom, so I don't really want to call her mom. <laughs> Tasnim's mom, Lucy, was just 16 years old when she was killed in the fire. Since then, Tasnim has been looked after by her granddad, George, the only other person to escape the fire alive. It, it was difficult growing up. Especially in primary school, people would like ask questions like, why did you live with him? Where's your family? What happened? I didn't know what to say. It's not kind of like, hey, I'm Taz. My dad's a murderer. <laughs> Want to be friends? My granddad, he actually found me a card. It got burnt a little bit, but it's not that bad. It kind of just says, to dad, happy birthday. From Lucy, it's nice that I can hold something that they've held and there's some kind of connection because the police took everything that was kind of good enough to keep and the rest got burnt. There's a lot of questions. Why did he do this? What really went on? What really happened? I'm kind of just starting from square one going into all this and it's a very big task and it's kind of daunting. Tasnim's dad has spent the last 18 years in prison. Soon, a parole board will decide whether he should be released. To help make this decision, Tasnim and her family have been asked what they think. The parole board basically wanted me to explain how I felt. They wanted me to give a statement to appear in court. I'm not really sure how I feel about it. It's all very confusing. 
I think it's um, difficult to give an opinion on a situation that I don't fully understand yet, and I'm still learning about. Um, you know, I, I don't know what was going on in their relationship and what was going on separate to their relationship in their own lives. And I think it's important to learn about it so that I can form an opinion and I can understand why things happened. Tasnim's search for answers will take her back to the late 90s when her mum met her dad. She starts with one of the few people in her life who knew them both. I haven't really spoken to my Uncle Eddie about the situation before, but I want to ask him about his memories, try and find out about the relationship that my parents had. Hopefully my uncle knows something. Hi. Tasnim's Uncle Eddie is her granddad's brother. She meets him at the pub he owns in Telford. 18 years ago, he was the first family member at the scene of the fire. Thank you. There you go. So what do you remember of the night of the fire? I remember getting a phone call. It said there'd been a fire at George's. So I jumped in the car, went round there, and there was nothing left of the house, nothing. And I, and I asked the police, I said, any survivors? And they said, uh, yes, three. My granddad only had a pair of trousers on, no shoes, no socks, no shirt, blanket around him, holding you, just in a nappy. And your dad, Mr. Maroud, was stood there, fully clothed, with his coat on. It was a bit strange at the time, and I kept thinking, if you've been in a fire, you haven't got time to put your coat on. Well, you haven't. What do you remember about my dad? Like, how was he? He seemed pretty calm for someone that had been in a fire, or supposedly been in a fire. Did he ever show his condolences? None. Wow. Not to us, anyway. <clears throat> Gosh. Your granddad took you to my mother's. Your great-grand. Yeah. And your dad turned up in a taxi asking to take you out for the day. And this is when I said, he's not, he's not taking the aid. Because I looked at him and I said, I believe you've done it. That's what I said to him. I said, I told him to go. And um, he got arrested later that day or the next day. Did everyone feel a bit of relief because you were with him all the Anger. time? Or... Anger. Somebody going around saying that he didn't do it. I mean, that, that's not a nice person, is it? If he's done it, own up to it. So what do you actually remember about their relationship? I did. They were always arguing, your mother and Azir. Mm -hmm. he'd, he'd fallen out with your mother yeah. for reasons we don't know. It's starting to piece together that they had a very strange relationship. I'm not saying that uh, your mum was totally innocent. She might have been said nasty things to him, and people do react to that. But you, you, you shouldn't react by setting fire to house and killing people. Did you ever ask him um, personally um, why he did what he did? What your dad? Or did you ever get a chance to? Never a chance to. And the only person that knows these answers are either dead or inside. Hmm. I just think that I could, could I have done more? That's what I regret. I possibly could. We possibly all could as a family. So that's my biggest regret. St. George? Yeah. <laughs> Just saw him. He's not in a happy place, your granddad. He never has been since this. It's destroyed George's life totally. The only family he's got is you, really. He loves you anyway, but you know that. When I see my granddad, I don't see him as some poor, you know, tragic, survivor I, I see him as my granddad someone who who makes me laugh and is a bit weird and a bit funny and 
he's just a granddad. The Lowe's were asleep when the fire at their home in Telford started in the early hours of Saturday morning. Neighbours and fire crews fought to get them out alive. Searching for clues, the police are determined to find out who would kill three members of one family. Police say they can find no reason why anyone would want to carry out such an attack. The family had been well liked and respected. I only know what my family have told me. My granddad said that on the night that it happened, my dad came in during the night. He carried me out before he poured petrol all over the stairs and set fire to the house. And what do you think about the fact that your dad rescued you from it? I don't know. I don't know how it makes me feel because my dad wanted me alive. I guess. So, but then it's it's kind of like um, a catch twenty two. He he wanted to look after me, but he didn't really look after me, and he uh, let my mum die. Hoping to discover more about her mum and dad's relationship, Tasnim heads to a local archive to look for newspaper reports from the time. Hiya, um, I registered online. Um, is it possible to get a ticket? Yeah, no problem. Thank you. The main question that I'd always have is why? Okay, so these are, these are the Shropshire Stars, the whole of the month of, of August 2000. I'm hoping that articles have some kind of clues. Hopefully, if we find out about kind of their relationship, it might give us a better understanding of what drove them to, to do this. I've never seen this photo of me before. <laughs> Oh, look, there's a different picture of them, too. Oh, gosh. The 25-year-old taxi driver said today that they were planning to move into a home together in Wellington after spending most of their two-year relationships living with Mr and Mrs Lowe. We were going to get married, and I have been doing up a place for us to all move into, he said. That's interesting. That's never been mentioned. Especially my family's never mentioned that as well. There's um, more. He and Lucy had been talking in their bedroom when the fire started. Suddenly, the whole room started filling with black smoke, he said. I was shouting and screaming to Lucy, but she had disappeared out of the room. I just did not know what to do. I opened the window and climbed out. Sounds a bit weird. I think what he's trying to do is portray uh, an image of a happy family. But if you were that mad about her, you'd want to go after her. You'd want to get everybody out that you can. So two of Lucy's friends gave statements against my dad. He was possessive. And then they put, um, he only wanted Lucy for one purpose. I don't know if he was possessive, I don't know if he, if he wasn't. And the fact that it, it's Lucy's friends, it, it could be biased, but it could also provide a really good picture. This is really interesting. Basically, it talks about, obviously, like she was um, publicly humiliating my dad. And then it says, Lucy slapped him. There were also several rows in the street, and it was suggested that she was out of control. That's a statement. Wow. County's worst ever murderer gets life. 
house plays killer jailed. Oh gosh. <laughs> it seems as if my parents' relationship was very toxic, kind of destructive, I guess. So there was like a lot more to it than kind of, I don't know, kind of what people have made out. There's, there's a lot more drama as such. Granddaddy, Taz. Tasnim's invited her granddad round. Hiya. All right, love. How are you? I'm not too bad. How are you? Oh, so. Is it cold out? A bit cool. Hmm. <laughs> not too bad. She wants to know what he can remember. Back memories to me. What memories? When me and your nan, Linda. Oh dear. Do you want some tissue? <clears throat> Anybody that meets my granddad knows it's very raw, it's as if it happened three days ago, and that he's still trying to process it in his head. Like, even just losing one child is horrible, but to wipe out a whole family, a person's life, really. It's like a complete nightmare. Because Linda used to like music, dancing, having a good time, like, you know, enjoying herself, meeting people. They were good memories. Can't beat them. What was I like as a child, like, when you looked after me? You were all right. It's when you got a bit older. <laughs> you reminded me of your mum. Yeah. <laughs> sort of thing. You went the right way, which was good. I do miss them. Really do. Something you'll never get over. Do you think it's gotten easier? Pardon? Do you think it's gotten easier over the years? No. No. Still with me. Memories. It's always there. Birthdays, anniversaries. And when it happened. Yeah. So I've got them. I don't know, it's dessert. I just still want to know why. I know. There's no answers. Never will be. I don't think I'll get them from him. No way. Oh, that's good. I like this. What is it? Mm -hmm. do, 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 do. Well, you leave with your heart in this cloudy. The jury took just under three hours to reach guilty verdicts on all three charges of murder and one of attempted murder. The judge sent him down for life. With her granddad only able to give her limited information, Tasnim looks for television footage that might fill in some of the blanks. After the verdict, George Lowe was too upset to speak, but his brother read a statement on his behalf. Although it's a victory for justice in my family, it won't bring Linda, Lucy and Sarah back. I will never forgive him for taking them away from me. Looking back on the past 15 months, it was like living a nightmare. I now have to try and pick up the pieces and look after the most important person in my life, which is Tasnim, his, his granddaughter. She is all I have left, and at the moment she is too young to understand what has happened to her mother. But when the time is right, I'll explain to her what happened. And I, I know it won't be easy. Thank you very much. <laughs> that made you a bit sad? A little bit. <laughs> Hard. A little bit. 
Oh. <laughs> wow. That was heavy. <laughs> um, I think it's just, like, really difficult because I don't remember any of this and I don't remember kind of how my granddad had to cope with me and how he had to, you know, get up every morning and dress me, feed me, take me to school, come home, you know, do my washing, clean up after all my mess and do all the everyday stuff. And him kind of have to, like, kind of look after another daughter. And him going through the stages of having a child again, it's just overwhelming, I guess. We come to remember Linda and Sarah and Lucy. We come to give thanks for their lives and for their love. <laughs> May they be to all who see them a reminder of their beauty and their love. Amen. Growing up with him, he did try. It's not easy looking after a kid, especially going through all that. But I wish that there was somebody who didn't really have all, all these problems going on before they had to look after somebody else. When I was in secondary school, a lot of my friends, they had strict parents, and I was, like, doing my own thing. I probably would have done better in my education if my circumstances at home were different. I kind of wish I had a stricter parent, but he wasn't really like that, and I don't blame him. But it's bad because, like, I wanted, like, security, and I couldn't have it. Kitchen's a bit of a mess, and the dead flowers. Um, have you lived on your own before? No. I lived in a house share. So this is really new and exciting. I'm really happy. Since she turned 18, Tasnim has been living independently and is trying to move on with her life. I don't regret anything. If I did, then I'd be very unhappy and live a very miserable life. And I could blame that on the fact of my past, but somehow I've managed to move past that. I'm going back to college and doing a business admin um, level three. I haven't decided what I want to do, but there's a lot of opportunities for me. So I'm really excited about it all. But whilst Tasnim was attempting to build a new future, what she didn't know was that 200 miles away in London, a journalist was working on a story that would change everything. It was about child sexual exploitation in Telford. We first started to look at Telford in 2016. I was put in touch with Holly, who was a survivor of abuse from Telford. She was telling me she had been groomed and abused really horrifically. Um, it, was, it was beyond appalling. Geraldine McKelvey's investigation uncovered multiple victims of sexual abuse and evidence of a grooming ring operating in the area at the time Tasnim's mum was killed. I asked why, why didn't you tell anybody? Why did you keep this to yourself? And she said that there was a story in Telford of a girl called Lucy Lowe. As our Ali Mehmood had made her pregnant at 14 and had burned down her house and killed her whole family. She was always told to remember that name, Lucy Lowe. And if she had stepped out of line, they promised that they would do to her what they'd done to Lucy. 
on in Telford, that was a very real threat. The article exposing one of Britain's biggest child grooming scandals made front page news. On Mother's Day, actually, there was a whole big article about child exploitation in Telford. But it was Lucy's photo as the front cover, and there was a lot to do with Lucy and my dad. I wasn't expecting it. No one was expecting it from the family, and it all kind of blew up from there. I picked the paper up, and there, there's a picture of Lucy on the front page. I went, it was a bit of a shock. Do you remember what you did? <laughs> what I did? I had a couple of stiff drinks. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like you're knowing your whole life that something is this way and it's only this way. And then all of a sudden, without even realising, Bang, you're over here. Next time, dark secrets emerge about Tasnim's parents' relationship. She wanted away from him and he wouldn't let her go. He become more controlling, more possessive. And getting nasty. I heard somebody shout out, rape, rape, rape. And she gets closer to the truth of her mum's murder. I just couldn't believe that nobody had joined the daughters before. I was just 16 months old when my dad saved my life here. 19 years ago, Tasnim Lowe's home was destroyed in a fire. Police in Shropshire have begun a murder inquiry after a suspected arson attack in which a mother and her two teenage daughters were killed. I was found wrapped in a blanket under an apple tree. I got a bit of fire on my face. In that fire, Tasnim lost her grandmother, her aunt, her mum, and then her dad, when he was convicted of their triple murder. My dad carried me out of the house. He wanted to look after me, but he didn't really look after me, and he uh, let my mum die. Now, Tasnim's dad is up for parole and could be released from prison. And the parole board has asked Tasnim to tell them what she thinks. I don't know what I'm supposed to say or how I feel about my dad, because I don't know him. So far, she's discovered that her parents' relationship was volatile. They were always arguing, your mother and us, as here. Mm -hmm. it, it'd fallen out with your mother yeah. for reasons we don't know. And that her dad was controlling. He was possessive. And then they put, um, he only wanted Lucy for one purpose. But the most shocking discovery was when a newspaper article revealed a grooming ring was operating in Telford at the time of her mum's murder. Even the possibility of a, of a different story seems ridiculous to me because you only know it one way. This is the newspaper article that came out on Mother's Day. And that's my mum, Lucy, on the front page. Up to a thousand children could have suffered in Britain's worst known abuse scandal. Sex gangs targeted girls as young as 11. 
really took me back because obviously 18 years later, you're not expecting to see that, especially not on Mother's Day. In the article, there are claims that hundreds of young girls have been groomed and abused in Telford. And it links Tasnim's mum's murder to the scandal. Lucy Lowe, 16, was killed in 2000 after Azar Ali Mahmood set fire to their house. Lucy's death was used in warning to other girls, according to victims. One said, I was scared my family would die like Lucy's. I thought I'd only be safe if I killed myself. I don't know what to say to that, to be honest. It's horrible. So many questions. Like, honestly, if somebody looked in my head, <laughs> it just never stops. You've got to think. Other victims have said that they've been threatened in the way that she died. So it makes you think, well, is that just a threat or was my mum groomed? Is this why she was killed? The journalist who broke the story is Geraldine McKelvey. She's been investigating the Telford abuse ring for three years. I started to look at Telford because a survivor of abuse called Holly. I thought it was just an individual story. I didn't quite realise how big it would become. We're looking at four decades of really horrendous abuse to young girls. In the course of her investigation, Geraldine took first-hand accounts from survivors of abuse. So now we're heading towards the Recon Hill. It's um, a famous beauty spot on the outskirts of Telford. Almost every girl that I've, I've spoken to has some sort of horrific story about being taken up the Recon to be abused. But how did these girls end up in these men's carts? A lot of the perpetrators started off being quite nice to the girls, like buying them takeaway food, buying them, you know, presents and things like that. The girls would be in too deep by the time that relationship became really abusive. They would take them out here, they would be raping them. Sometimes they would be passing them around their friends and making money from them that way. If the girls didn't do what they wanted them to do, they would threaten them. And they would say things like, we're going to rape your mum, we're going to rape your sisters. And obviously the biggest threat that was used in Telford was we we're going to burn down your house and kill your whole family. And because of the Lucy Lowe case, that was a very real threat. Telford's grooming scandal spans four decades, including the 90s, when Tasnim's parents first met. Now she wants to know if her mum could have been one of its victims. My mum was 14 when she fell pregnant with me and my dad was 10 years older than her. When I would tell people a story, like when I said that they were in a relationship and he was a lot older, they'd look at me like, hmm, that's, that's a bit funny, that is, that's a bit dodgy. I'd be like, yeah, it, it is quite a big gap, but they were in a relationship, so it doesn't really matter. Now I'm kind of, I'm not sure. Tasnim's hunt for clues leads her to the original court transcripts from the time of her dad's trial. Now, members of the jury, you know that the family consisted of Mr and Mrs Lowe and their two daughters. Lucy had had a baby when she was 14. The father of Lucy's child was the defendant, Azar Mahmood. She met the defendant when she was only 13 or just 14. He was nine years older than her, 22 or 23. You heard the father, Mr George Lowe, ask about his feelings when Lucy was pregnant for the first time. And his answer was, well, I wasn't pleased really, nor was my wife. But he went on to say, when Tasneem was born, she became just a ray of sunshine. It's a bit confusing. 
people didn't really acknowledge the fact that there was an age gap, even though it was really clear. And it wasn't just two years or three years. It was nearly 10 years. <laughs> she was a child. This is basically about my parents' relationship, um, according to my mum's friends. There was things about how he would check her to, like, examine her body to see if she had been with another person. He'd ring her to say that he had somebody following her so that he could keep tabs on her. My dad was asking if she was with other people. There were suspicions that Lucy um, could be having sex with men in the churchyard. It's very unclear what has obviously gone on there. We don't know if it was a gang thing or if it was exploitation. We don't really know because it wasn't really looked into. As the verdicts were announced, George Lowe has said he'll now be dedicating the rest of his life to looking after his granddaughter. He said he'll find it hard to explain to her why her father is in prison for murder. Tasnim has grown up knowing her dad killed her mom, but now wonders if he may have committed other crimes against her. She contacts a court reporter from the time. Hello, Miss Liz. Hi, Liz, it's Tasnim. So I'm just calling to ask you a few questions um, about the trial. So how long did you work on the trial for? All the way through, really, because it was a very high-profile case for us at the time. So obviously now that it's 2018, um, we've discovered a lot of things to do with my dad and to do with their relationship, because obviously the age gap wasn't really a red flag back then. It was kind of just focused on a murder trial. I, I definitely can't recall it, it being a, a theme that was raised with any prominence. And they were characterised as very much throughout as the boyfriend and girlfriend. But Lucy's age when she died was known, and they would have known his, his age. And they were told that she'd have a first child at, at 14. Mm -hmm. so, so all of that was out there. Looking back, terms like child sexual exploitation, grooming, weren't terms that were even widely used or, or known about. And I think looking back now, we would have to see everything really through, kind of through the lens of what we now know happened in Telford and has happened in Oxford and Rochdale and, and all those places. Mm -hmm, definitely. This big feature of the case was, was you right from the start. So, yeah. um to hear from you all these years later. Um, <laughs> I, hope, I hope you do get answers. Thank you. What's really upsetting is grooming itself wasn't a thing. There wasn't a label for it. Even still back then, you would know that there's something wrong. You'd know that she was 14 and she was a child. Um, and most people forget about that. The scale of the abuse in Telford only came to light slowly, as Geraldine's investigation revealed more and more victims and multiple perpetrators. When I started doing the investigation, I was trying to um, connect as many offenders as possible to see how much of a network it actually was. Because at the start, I didn't know were people acting on their own or, or were they part of a more organised group of people carrying out exploitation. The name of the street kept coming up. And at one point further down the street, there was a row of seven or eight houses and there was pretty much a rapist in every house. It was unbelievable. There was one of the perpetrators. His family lived in one house and the house next door. Um, 
was being used just for the purpose of underage girls being sold and raped. Flats and houses in Telford were used. A lot of girls were taken to be abused in rooms above takeaways. Perpetrators making thousands of pounds from selling girls. When you come down these streets, it's quite unsettling. You just look at everybody and think, I wonder how much did, did you know about it? It's hard to get your head around. News of Tasnim's search for answers has spread. One of her mum's friends has got in touch and asked to meet her. I'm a bit nervous. I don't know what she'll say. I'm, I'm really concerned about what she knows and what I might potentially know after meeting her. It feels like you're quite torn between wanting to know about your dad's potential involvement in grooming and also not wanting to know. Yes. <laughs> Hiya. Hiya. You okay? Fearing for her safety. The friend wants her identity to be kept secret. <laughs> when I saw you walking up there, you reminded me straight of there. When was the last time you saw me? When you was a baby. I remember when she was pregnant with you and she said, don't tell anyone. They haven't told my mum and dad yet. <laughs> but yeah, she was over the moon. She was so happy. Thank you. So what kind of memories do you have with Lucy? I um, always remember just having fun with her. We were very mischievous and she was the best friend anyone could ever wish for. What do you really remember about their relationship and how they met? Because everyone that I have asked, they don't know. So it's quite yeah, it's unusual. I'm, I remember him approaching her. He was in his taxi and his spotted her and pulled over and, and started chatting her up. She was absolutely smitten with him. It was like, you know, oh, my first love. I couldn't understand how she did fall for him because he was a charmer. But that time went on, they started arguing more. They'd become more controlling, more possessive and getting nasty. She started to hate him. She, she used to tell me, you know, she wanted away from him and he wouldn't let her go. He used, that's when he started used to threaten her. And so she felt like she had to stay with him. But then he wasn't, you know, really faithful to her. He was always with other girls. So would you say that this whole kind of grooming scandal, do you think she was being groomed? He just wanted her for him, or he was grooming other girls, if that makes sense. What I found out is that they always have that bond that the keep is theirs, but then they have their others. So, you know, the other people that you knew about him grooming, can you can you tell me a bit about that? Um, just that I used to see him, see them in this taxi. Um, there was one day that I was upset and he drove past and saw me. He knew I was vulnerable and he groomed me. At first, it was like someone actually cares. You know, someone's there, they want to actually listen to me. They, you know, they want to help me. And then one, one day, I, I did end up sleeping with him. Um, you know, he knew what he was up to. He was manipulating me from day one. And when I look back at all the things he used to say to me, he was grooming me, he was trying to get in my head. It's mad how it all starts like, as he had these friends, 
that he introduced to me, and that's how I got involved in all of it. So, what would happen? They would get, like, a litre bottle of vodka or Bacardi. They'd end up saying, oh, let's play a game. You know, like, spin the bottle. I'm only 15. I'm absolutely drunk, steaming drunk. I'm being sick. And they'd just be laughing, thinking it was hilarious. And that's when they would rape me. And it was all my dad's friends? Yes. Do you believe that um, if Lucy was going through any kind of grooming or sex ring or anything like that, that she probably would come, come to you? It's quite hard because I didn't go to anyone. I was so scared of them back then. Um, when things happen, you just block it out of your head and you just act like nothing's happened and move on. That's how things worked. For years and years and years, I've kept my mouth you know, shut. I've had to be quiet. friend and me looking through her red box of memories faded I'm sure but love seems to stick in her veins you know I was quite shocked about my dad not only befriended Lucy's friend and like sexually to hear that it also happened to other girls. There's parts of me that see him to be a predator. The evidence just kind of stacks up. Things I've read in the court transcripts, things I've heard from other people, all this building up is making me think that Lucy was in an abusive relationship. She was abused and you know, she was probably groomed. Armed with her evidence, Tasnem travels to London to meet Geraldine, the journalist who broke the story of Telford's grooming scandal. Although I believe that Lucy was being groomed, I like that confirmation, you know, from someone who's done so much work on it. Come Hiya. in, it's uh, just through there. Okay. Since reading your article, it's changed the way how I've thought about, you know, my dad's relationship with my mom, and it's changed everything. So if I show you the um, court summing up, yeah. um, it might explain a lot more. So one of the things, there's been a lot of uh, talk of Lucy performing sexual acts on men in a churchyard. Did it happen a lot, from what you know? If it is the same churchyard that I'm thinking of, and I'm thinking based on where in Telford Lucy lived, it probably is. I've definitely heard of other girls um, being taken there for similar purposes. What else kind of came out of the, of the court case? One of the things that I've never heard before, um, which quite surprised me, is um, my dad would check her body every night to see if my mom had been with any other guy. Um, I've never heard of that before. Wow. Yeah. Is that quite normal? It... I think it's a sign of a, a very, very controlling relationship um, and one that fits with a pattern of what of what we believe that, that was happening in Telford to a lot of girls just like your mum. Another sort of dimension to this, um, and it might explain why your dad appeared possessive and controlling, there were definitely several groups of organised crime gangs and they would quite often have fights over who got to control what girls. It might be that there was a bit of rivalry over girls like your mum. Um, I know that the main exploitation in Lucy's case appears to have been from your dad, but it wouldn't surprise me if there were other men that would exploit her. It does seem to feed into the bigger picture of, of what was going on in, in Telford at, at that time. One thing that really um, struck me is why no one looked into it. I mean, social services, school, even the hospital. I know there were a lot of a lot of girls like your mum who were pregnant before they were 16. I spoke to somebody at your mum's school and she said that the, the girls would be getting told off um, 
because they were talking they were talking about what was happening to them. Teachers were actually like reprimanding them rather than saying, oh my God, like all these girls are saying really similar things. They're all having sex underage. Should we start asking them why that's happening and why it's happening to so many girls? But there was no sort of professional kind of curiosity that there should have been. <laughs> that's why I, I'm struggling because it's very difficult for me to understand a world where, you know, children were ignored for mm. things like this and... <sighs> yeah, yeah. How has this whole process made you feel towards your dad? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's so difficult because I have the facts. Mm -hmm. They're right in front of me, but it's it's really difficult to to talk about it and to even think about it. It would be different if she was here. Um, he's the only parent I have. I just think about all the times that could have been different. Do you know what I mean? I always think about like sports day, parenting, everything, birthdays. But then I think, well, there's only one reason why I don't have that, and that's because of my dad. And I think I'm never really gonna be able to look past that. But at the same time, I don't hate him. I don't despise him. So it's one of them. After all she's discovered, Tasnim is left with a big question. Why didn't her granddad step in and stop what was happening to her mum? Oh. I guess I um, find it quite hard to understand why at the time he didn't really um, see what was wrong with the relationship. All right. So what do you really remember about the relationship back then? Well, didn't well, he used to come down the house, that's about all I know, really, you know, and I didn't take much interest in him, really. I didn't, honest. I don't know why. I read um, in the transcript that you said that they would constantly be arguing and it would they wake you up. They did argue off. a lot, oh, yeah. They did argue, but I don't know what over. Did you ever talk to her about it or try to? Well, you can't. You couldn't talk to your mum. Her friend said that most of their arguments would be him demanding sex from from her and her saying no and them arguing quite a lot. Well, he used to go upstairs a lot and I heard somebody shout out, rape, rape, rape. So I went running in, kicked the door down. And next thing you know, he was running down the stairs. The next door neighbour's boyfriend come running out. He ran after him. That was it, like, you know. So why did nobody ever think to go to the police? I don't know. Was she crying out for help? I think she was. I think her and Why didn't behavior... she come to us? If she'd have come to us, yes. We'd have done something. We would have done. You can't say, she why heard. didn't she go to us? Mm. When you heard, you yeah. and Linda heard her mm. shout rape. Yeah. But it was it not... Bad, but nothing happened. For being abused, yeah. But that was abuse. I just think it's sad because she was suffering. Oh, anyway. Makes me sad. But I don't like the fact that there's a lot of blame of mm. who's at fault. Yeah. And it makes me quite sad because nobody's really acknowledging the fact that th this thing happened and you can't really blame anyone because it's happened now. You can say blame me and Linda, can't you? Do you? I can't blame myself for not doing more. Watch what you're doing. Bye. <laughs> I'll see you, Taz. Take care, love. You too. Bye. 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 I think I think she was very ignored. She wasn't listened to. If people had intervened when they heard about the rape allegation. He could have gone to prison, but obviously that, that didn't happen. Nobody listened and she got murdered.
I was just 16 months old when my dad saved my life here. 19 years ago, Tasnim Lowe's home was destroyed in a fire. Police in Shropshire have begun a murder inquiry after a suspected arson attack in which a mother and her two teenage daughters were killed. I was found wrapped in a blanket under an apple tree. I got a bit of fire on my face. In that fire, Tasnim lost her grandmother, her aunt, her mum, and then her dad when he was convicted of their triple murder. My dad carried me out of the house. He wanted to look after me, but he didn't really look after me. And he uh, let my mom die. Now, Tasnim's dad is up for parole and could be released from prison. And the parole board has asked Tasnim to tell them what she thinks. I don't know what I'm supposed to say or how I feel about my dad, because I don't know him. So far, her search has shed new light on her mum's murder. She used to tell me, you know, she wanted away from him and he wouldn't let her go. And uncovered evidence that she was likely groomed and abused. We're looking at four decades of really horrendous abuse to young girls. I heard somebody shout out, rape, rape, rape. So why did nobody ever think to go to the police? Now, Tasnim wants to know why her dad wasn't prosecuted for sex crimes. You know, they are very controlling. Um, it has to be their way or no way. Nobody listened. And she got murdered. Tasnim's been searching for answers for eight months when she gets a call from the police asking her and her granddad George to come in for a meeting. The only thing that I've been told is that the police have found some of my baby clothes and some jewellery. I don't know what we'll find. I don't know how it'll make me feel. I don't know how my granddad will react. I hate the sense of not knowing what's happening or what's going to happen, so it's, it makes me quite uncomfortable. For 19 years, the few belongings that survived the fire have been held by the police. But now they've decided it's time to return them. Hours later, back at home, Tasnim looks at them for the first time. To be fair, that doesn't look damaged at all. It doesn't, does it? No. Can you smell it, though? Come on. Can you, you can really smell it. Yeah. Can you? Oh, dear. But it doesn't look damaged. Oh, look. <laughs> It's me with uh, a tigger. Oh. Who's that? Wow. That's really burnt. It's actually got writing. Is it? It's my full name, and then it's got the year I was born. That's nice, though. It's uh, a birthday card. Look at that. Wow, look at all this. Look mm -hmm. at... It's, like, all stuck together. But this one's from Lucy, but I can't... I can't actually get to it. <laughs> They're all literally stuck. <laughs> Gosh. Among the items, Tasnim makes an astonishing discovery. Three diaries written by her mum, Lucy, in the months before her death. Did you even know that she had diaries? No, I didn't know she had them. There's even, like, little things that she stuck on there. Like, whoa! Lucy wrote the diaries in 1999, when she was just 14. They cover her pregnancy and the first three months of Tasnim's life. I 
Oh, look, that's all the names. With the girls' names, and these were the boys' names. She actually put Muslim and Arabic. I would have been Hassan. I might have been called James. James. What? I lost, what is it, out on a lot of school, especially this year. That is very vital. I know I'm also losing out on my childhood, but I'm not really bothered as long as my little girl is safe and, well, nothing else matters. If I had the chance to go back and change things, I would soon turn it all down. Having Tasnim has made me more grown up and more understanding. Yeah. That's a nice ending to, like, Yeah, she's the... quite good, what she writes. I think she's very articulate, very clever in how she writes things. Right, so go and pull that across <laughs> to where you want it. Tasnim and her boyfriend, Jordan, have returned to the scene of the fire to clean up her mum's memorial. As I've started to understand my mum more, I've started to take more of an interest into the memorial, I'm starting to get to know her for the first time, and especially with reading the diaries, I I feel like I, I know her in some ways. Now I'm enjoying it. It's, it's like time for each other. Like it, it's weird, but like a bonding session and enjoyment at the same time and doing it for the right reason. It's teamwork as well. Yeah. Seeing her smile, that's the main thing. I think we kind of um, underestimated how, how much we'd need. I definitely did. <laughs> Nineteen years ago, the community came out in force to mourn those killed by Tasnim's dad in the fire. What they didn't know then was that he would later be accused of grooming and abusing local teenage girls, including Tasnim's mom, Lucy, who was just 13 when they met. It's difficult coming to terms with the fact that this is why I exist, because of abuse. It's very bizarre and you're very conflicted because on one hand, that's your mom and they've had to go through this horrific experience. But on the other hand, this is your dad and although they've committed these horrific crimes, they are still, unfortunately, both your parents, whether you like it or not. So I think it's very, very difficult for people like me in that situation to, you know, kind of summarise their thoughts and feelings towards their parents and to understand it um, and understand their identity. During the years Tasnim's mum Lucy was being abused in Telford, there were other young girls in Rotherham going through similar experiences. It is the town where 1,400 children were abused while the authorities looked the other way. The scandal of what happened here in Rotherham has left deep scars. On the streets of Rotherham, hundreds of children were sexually exploited. When the Rotherham abuse scandal was finally exposed, it was the first of many to come to light. Tasnim has come here to meet Sammy Woodhouse, a survivor of the grooming. She also had a child by her abuser. I really want to talk to Sammy about her experiences. Sammy was 14 when she met her abuser and he was 10 years older than her, so that's the exact same as Lucy. Sammy is one of the very few to waive her right to anonymity and now campaigns to tackle child grooming. This is interesting. She put, I'd always denied being groomed, 
whatever that was. The penny finally dropped. At home, I fell to the floor, crying hysterically. I was now 27, and the past 13 years of my life had been a big, fat lie. That's really sad. Good, thank you. How are you? Nice to meet you. I'm all right, thank you. Nice to meet you. Come through. OK, so my mum was 13 when she met my dad. He was 10 years older. Um, I think back then people, they kind of assumed that they were just in a relationship to get pregnant at 14 and then had me at 15. Your mum sounds a little bit similar to me. So when I was 14, I met my um, main abuser, which is now in prison. Um, and I saw that as a relationship. I didn't see it as abuse. Um, and I was made pregnant twice by him. First, when I was 14, which had an abortion. And then again, when I was 15, but I had my son and gave birth to him when I was 16. I was never treated as a, a victim by authorities. I was treated as his girlfriend, his mistress, and somebody that was a part of his gang rather than somebody that was a victim to it. So when, when you look back at that now with the relationship with your dad and your mum, do you recognise that as him grooming and abusing her? Yes, but because you're always taught, oh, well, they're, they're just my parents, they're in a relationship. I never saw it as anything else, and my family didn't see it as anything else. She was a child and he was an adult. And, you know, that is abuse. And a lot of people used to say about me, because my uh, rapist didn't sell me, um, a lot of people said, oh, well, Sammy weren't even a real victim. Um, you know, she was his girlfriend. He, there was also other girls that he didn't sell, but just because he didn't sell us, it doesn't mean that what he did was OK, kind of thing. Yeah. It also relates back to the question of why did he do what he did? Yeah. Because... Was it because he was jealous that she was going to find somebody or um, was, was he worried that she was going to tell somebody or... Mm. It's a lot of questions. I've never come across a paedophile or a rapist that isn't controlling over the victim. It has to be their way or no way. Uh, and if they can't control the situation, then that's it. They, they need to do something to, to put a stop to that. What's interesting as well with you is that you... You know, you don't blame your, your abuser. I do blame him, as far as I'm concerned. What he did was really bad. He's in prison for it. Um, he's going to be punished for it. I don't want anything to do with him. I don't want my son to have anything to do with him. He was somebody I once knew. But, yeah, I do think that children that are conceived through abuse and rape are very much forgotten about. I mean, how, how has it really affected his life? Is... It's been extremely difficult for him. Um, as well, he had a lot of issues with his identity because when the scandal hit about Rosroom, um, the headlines was majority of perpetrators were Pakistani Muslim and I remember him saying to me, well, I'm half a Pakistani, so does that mean I'm going to grow up to be a rapist as well? So, you know, I had to explain to him, well, actually, you know, people commit a crime because of, you know, a choice that they make. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't, you don't become a rapist because of, of the shade of your skin. Um, as well, I remember my son saying to me, uh, Mum, am I a rape baby? And I said, no, you're not, you're my baby. Everything that Sammy said really shocked me. I think what really stood out for me was her son. He, he's quite in a similar position to me. I. I don't know, have like a bad feeling towards myself due to the fact that my, I was born um, out of the fact that my, my dad raped my mom. Um, and I mean, it's, it's really not nice um, thinking of your way, thinking of yourself like that. I have to remind myself that he did what he did. However, that's, that wasn't my choice, that was his choice. Um, I'm my own person, and whatever other people do doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do that or you have to be that person. Um, we're all different.
It's now been two months since Tasnim met with the police to get back the belongings that survived the fire. This is my memory box, um, and it contains a lot of things about Lucy. It's where I keep the diaries that Lucy had. I've read about one and a half of the books. Uh, it's very intense. It's very, very personal. Like, she talks about um, how she feels about herself, how, like, her opinions on other people, stuff like that. And it's really nice to, to learn about just, like, really personal things that I would never know unless me and her had a heart-to-heart. -heart do you know what I mean? It's like some parts of the diaries are like that that person that keeps going back to their ex that are not very good for them. There's parts in there that make you really upset and make you kind of like, why, why? You get angry because you're just like, I wish I could do something, can't, <laughs> because it's a diary. There's a part in the diary that talks about how she went up the Reekin with some of her friends and some guys. It's so secluded and far from everything. And she performed um, sex acts on older men. Makes you think, well, who were they? What, what were they doing? What, were, what was going on? Did Ashley know? Did he not know? But that, all them things, like, it made me question whether she was being abused um, on a wider network than just Azzy. It talks about how, on one occasion, uh, as he asked her uh, via phone call if she had gone to the police um, in relation to them being in a relationship um, and she said no I wouldn't want to get him in trouble etc but if he if he had to ring her to say have you gone to the police about me there was clear indication that their relationship was illegal and, you know, it wasn't right. He knew. It's been estimated that up to a thousand young girls like Tasnim's mum Lucy have been abused by grooming gangs in Telford. It's a crime that continues today. Victims have been scared to come forward, but now a drop-in centre has been set up to help. The founder, a survivor herself, is haunted by what happened to Lucy. She wishes to remain anonymous. So when was it that you heard anything about you know, my mum's case and how was it? So I saw it in the newspaper um, originally, but I didn't really take much notice. Um, I was still quite young then. I wasn't a victim at the time when, when your mum um, died, so it wasn't really something that I took a lot of notice of. I became a victim the following year. I remember one event, and it really sticks out in my mind, that I'd been, I'd been gang raped, and this was a pre-planned thing that had happened, so it was uh, to get revenge on somebody else. I was the target and they had spiked my drink so that they could then pick me up later and, and take me off and gang rape me. Um, so after after that had happened, I managed to escape, ran home, um, and the next thing I knew, the man who had or orchestrated the gang rape um, was sat outside my mum's house in his car calling me. Um, telling me, don't forget Lucy Lowe. If you open your mouth, you will end up like Lucy Lowe. You're going to burn to death like she did. If you go to the police, if you tell anyone, that's going to happen to you and I'll make sure it happened to you. 
Um, and then he also said things like, the guy who's gone to prison for it, the man who's in prison for it, he didn't do it on his own. There was more of us than him. As a young girl, it did really scare me, and to the point where that stays with me now. To the point, I, I actually almost feel a little bit uncomfortable talking about it. Actually, it's chilling, and it it's quite a triggering thing to talk about because that was probably the worst threat I've ever had thrown against me. It blows my mind now that anybody could be so disgusting as to you to do that first of all to commit that crime and then to use it and then to use it again. Um, to control of you. The people using the threat would be, would be, it would be everybody, because once they realised you were afraid of that, that was your vulnerability. And I'll be honest, still to this day, I'm afraid of fire. So I, I th just think you're so brave. <laughs> Thanks. For doing this, I really do. I really do. Tasnim's dad has always denied setting the house on fire and killing her mum. Having never understood why he did it, Tasnim is returning to the original court documents to search for clues. This page is basically about my parents' relationship, according to my mum's friends. The majority of it is kind of painting my dad in a bad light. He'd ring her to say that he had somebody following her they were always arguing, uh, normally about him demanding for sex. Um, he was described as jealous and possessive. There was one incident where she was with her friend and she told him that she didn't want to have sex with him. She heard Lucy say, no, get off. And then heard my dad say that he would rape Lucy while she was asleep. My granddad, like, he heard it all. He told my dad to get out. The neighbours heard Lucy shouting that he was a rapist and he was going to rape her and stuff. They said that it, it was a week before the fire. It makes me wonder whether he was worried that she was going to tell people and expose him. Could that be the reason why he killed her? Despite the evidence, a motive for the fire was never established. Nor was Tasnim's dad prosecuted for any offence related to grooming or sex with a minor. The jury took just under three hours to reach guilty verdicts on all three charges of murder and one of attempted murder. The accused slumped forward in the dock and had to be supported by two prison officers as the judge sent him down for life. In the hope of discovering why her dad was never charged with any sex crimes, Tasnim arranges another meeting with the police. Thank you. It feels like quite a big day because I've learned so much in this past year that I really need definite answers to. And hopefully they'll be able to do that today. Hello, Tazim. How, how are you? Paul Moxley. Nice Hi, to meet you. Hi, I'm Taz. Hi, how are you? Where's I'm good, thank you. So one of the first questions I wanted to ask you was why my dad wasn't prosecuted with any sex crimes. Yeah, at that point in time, my colleagues who have long since retired, I think, were very much concentrating on the triple murder. And I could understand that, the reason would be in clearly because our focus was to get justice for the family, to make sure that we put the offender, your dad, in prison for a very, very long time. Um, what I would say is that your dad obviously has been given a life sentence for those three murders. And when he does come out of prison, clearly he will be managed by the, the probation service um, ad infinitum for the rest of his life, and it will be on licence. And it will be quite specific as to where he can and can't go. Um, but I understand you know, the fact that, you know, he wasn't charged with that particular sex offence at that time. Do you think that with the sex crimes it would have been different now? I think it's different now, definitely, than it was 20 years ago. We would be absolutely looking and going, how come your mum at 14 is pregnant? What's gone on there? Are there offences there? The, the child exploitation, 
the sexual offences that had occurred obviously would all form part of the evidence bundle that would ultimately be going to the CPS and then would be presented to a court. So in terms of, obviously, all the information we now know about the case, yeah. um, is he ultimately ever going to be convicted of the sex crimes against Lucy? So uh, I think there's a couple of issues there. The first one which initially springs to my mind is that uh, we, we might, as an organisation and as the CPS, be accused of what's called an abusive process. Yeah. And that is, um, you knew about these things 19 years ago when my client, if I put myself into the words of, of a defending solicitor or barrister, you knew about these things 20 years ago when my client was, was uh, charged with these murders. Why didn't they come to the fore then? Why weren't they brought to the court's attention at that point? Um, I think it's very important that um, my dad should be prosecuted for all crimes. Um, not really, obviously it affects me, yeah. but in a more general you know, point of view, I think um, it's kind of a fail in the justice system to only consider certain crimes over than others. Um, obviously, we all know that murder is the worst possible crime. Yeah. However, I think he should be on the sex offenders list mm. because just, just for the safety of others, Refusing to give up on securing justice for her mum, Tasnim is heading to London to meet her local MP. Lucy Allen. Thank you so much. Like many towns and cities across the country, Telford has had some experiences of distressing cases of child sexual exploitation. The authorities in Telford have now agreed to conduct an independent inquiry to find out what happened and to give victims answers. Tasnim wants to push for her mum's case to be included in the inquiry, set up to establish the scale of the abuse in Telford and why it went undetected for so long. In some ways, today is the last chance I can have um, my mum's case heard and have a better outcome than, than we have had so far. I think we have all been shocked by the horrific case that we have seen in uh, Telford of some of the most vulnerable in our country being preyed upon. I'm pleased that the authorities are now going to conduct an inquiry. It is, as my humble friend says, important that it begins its work in order to get to the truth and does that as quickly as possible. Hello, Tasnim. I'm Lucy Allen. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. Come take Thank a seat. You. It's very good of you to come all the way to London to come and talk to me about your story. So what do you actually know about my story? Well, I know about your mum and what happened to her and what was happening in Telford around young girls being exploited. What really boggles my mind um, is the fact that, obviously, <laughs> You look at my, my mom's age, her date of birth, my date of birth, his date of birth. I mean, I, I'm living proof. So I struggle to kind of understand why authorities didn't take action, you know, when I was born. One of the tragedies that was highlighted really from your mom's case was that the authorities simply didn't identify what grooming was, where those in authority have kind of said, well, it's something they've chosen, it's a lifestyle choice, this is something they've brought on themselves. There's an element, no doubt about it in my mind, a clear element of victim blaming. And it was that kind of narrative going on in the heads of people in authority, which actually led to this problem not coming to light for so long. So one of the questions that um, I have about the inquiry is um, whether my mum's case is going to be looked into. I think it's really important that it is. You made the point about somebody must have known just looking at the age of your mum, whether it was doctors when she had you in hospital or whether it was school. Yes, they knew. They knew. And it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me if people didn't say, hang on a minute, and someone else, oh, you know, don't bother, don't worry, don't, don't think about it, it really doesn't matter. I mean, there must have been an awareness of what was going on. 
Um, there's no doubt about that. At the time, the police knew about the sex crimes, but they didn't do anything about it. He's only been charged with murder because they, they wanted to convict him for the most serious crimes. And I said, now that we know everything we know, is that going to be changing at all? And they said no. So he won't be charged of any sex-related crimes, even now. I still think yeah. you need to acknowledge the problem. And, and oh, absolutely. Not doing that. And I think for you and for your family, that what happened to your mum not being treated as a sex crime, I think, is an important issue. Mm. And to have that acknowledged formally, um, I'm sure I can completely understand why that would be something that would make your family feel a better sense of closure and justice because it's not been acknowledged. It's just, oh, no, that was, that was arson, that was murder. OK, he's gone to prison, he's done yeah. his time, that's the end of that. No, it isn't. And I can see how important that is for you and for your family. I think the inquiry would give my family closure, but I think it gives me an opportunity to be uh, Lucy's voice because she couldn't. You are exactly that, your mum's voice. Thank you. I think it's very important for um, my mum's voice to be heard because of the fact that at the time she, she probably, if she did try to be heard, no one would do anything and, you know, now she can't do anything. She can't sh share her story. Twelve months into her search for answers, it's time for Tasnim to decide how she feels about her dad's upcoming parole and his potential release from prison. It's been helpful to get closer to the answer of why my dad did what he did. That's always been my main focus. I hope the parole board does what's best for my family. When you consider the murders and the sex crimes, I don't think 18 years is long enough. And I hope that with whatever the outcome is, that myself and my granddad are happy and feel safe. I have felt like I have become closer to my mom throughout all this process. I've been able to read her diaries and understand what she was like as a person, learning about all the little quirks that she has and just her as a teenager growing up in the 90s. It's, it's bittersweet there. Dear Taz, you are now 10 days old, but when you read this, you may be much older. I love you so much. You are the most beautiful little girl I have ever seen. I'm not just saying that because I'm your mom, but because it's true. You mean so much to me and I don't know where I would be without you. Maybe when you're older, we'll both have our good and bad times, but I'll always be there for you, no matter what. Just don't get pregnant at the age of 14. So remember to live life to the max, because I want the best for my little girl. Love you loads, always and forever, loads of Hugs and kisses, mommy.